Got it. So I'm today, as introduced, I'm going to be talking about four or more interesting Enigma-like machines with the for some value of four, because in fact, it's going to be some value between four and eight, depending on how, uh, how time runs. For some value of interesting, because my opinion of interesting might not match your opinion of interesting. And for some value of enigma-like, because I'm going to be a bit approximate in terms of how I define enigmas, enigma cipher machines. Now, what do I mean by Enigma-like is the first question. This is an enigma. You probably, many of you have seen it. If you've ever been to the National Museum of Computing, you will have seen one in the bomb room. If you've ever been to Bleshley Park, you will have, you will have seen several in, uh, in block uh, B, I believe it is. So what is an enigma machine? In fact, that's not such a simple answer. A question too simple to answer because there's a whole tree of Enigma machines that are available. There's something like 25 in this screen. Um, for example, this is an Enigma. It comes with cranking handles for making it work and a printer on top. And there's this machine which has only numerics, so it can't do letters. It's only used for encrypting numerical messages. This is the one that most people will be familiar with. It's a three rotor Enigma, the plug board at the front. And the, the Enigma also comes fairly commonly in a, in a four rotor mode. It either has four rotors or three rotors and a settable Enigma, a settable reflector. But in general, it looks much like this. And the main range that people know is the Wehrmacht machines, Wehrmacht and Kriegs machine. Um, marine just like this. And these are the major components. There's ref rotors and a reflector at the top at the back. In front of that, there's a light panel with 26 bulbs. In front of that, there's a keyboard with 26 keys. And in front of that is a plug board, which can physically take up to 13 uh, plugs, pairing one letter to another, 13 cables. In the back, in the lid of the Enigma, there is typically a uh, sheet that says this, which as I'm sure you can all see, is uh, primarily cleaning instructions. <clears throat> so I have a little demo here, which I'm thankful to uh, Ralph Simpson of San Jose for publishing it and have permitted me to use it. And I say thank you to Ralph because I happen to have seen him in the audience. He must have gotten up real early to uh, join this call. <clears throat> At the top, you can see the rotors and the reflector. Below that, the light panel. Below that, the keyboard. And below that, the plug board. And if I just hit the letter A, for example, a current. Oh, first of all, the rotors at the top turn. The right rotor always turns. If the right rotor has stepped 26 times, then the middle rotor steps. If the middle rotor has stepped 26 times, then the left rotor steps. So that gives you 17,576 possible positions for these three 26 position rotors. Having said that, that's not quite accurate because there's a little quirk in the system, which means you lose a few hundred from that 17,576. But uh, we don't need to worry about that for now. So next. A current flows from the battery through the A key and into the plug board. And A, as it happens, is wired to M. So the A is now converted to M. So that's the first stage of the encryption process. The current then goes up to the entry drum and it goes into the rightmost rotor at position M, where it gets converted into a B, and then the middle rotor converts it into a J, and then the leftmost rotor converts it into an F. The reflector then converts it into some other letter than F, and in this case it's P, back through the wheels, out of the entry drum, which is now also an exit drum, through the plug board again, 
it's, it's now the letter O, it's converted into the letter H by the plug board. And finally, the circuit is complete and H lights up. If I were to hit A again, the chances are 25 out of 26 that a different letter would light up. It's not impossible for the H to be derived again from the A, from the, from the new position of the rotors, but it's a, it's a small chance. So what do I mean by Enigma-like? Rotors with wires in them. Rotors typically double-sided with one wire coming in on one face, coming out on the other face in a different position. Although that's actually not mandatory, you can have rotors with some of the wires coming in and out of the same position. A keyboard and a lamp board or a printer, or indeed both. And then optional, the plug board at the front of the Enigma. I've made that optional because that allows me to include more machines than otherwise I would be able to include. And the reflector, the, the, which is basically the leftmost rotor, which doesn't generally speaking rotate. I've made that optional as well because that also allows me to include one particular interesting machine that wouldn't otherwise um, pass the test. And then rings on the rotors. When I say rings, if you look at this picture here, you can see that the rotor is actually in two parts. There's the wiring matrix in the bottom right section of the diagram here, and a ring with the letters on at the top left part. And that ring with the letters on can be set in one of 26 positions relative to the wiring, uh, the wiring matrix. Uh, as it happens, the positions are subtractive to each other. So a rotor position of B with a ring setting of B is equivalent to a rotor position of A with a ring setting of A and so on through the alphabet. But this does make a difference with the turnover points, the stepping points of the wheels, such that I've, I've quickly encrypted here. This is a very long text message for turnover testing. And for various settings of the rotors and rings, you can see that a gap is appearing as I step through the rotor and ring positions, a gap which is highlighted in the, in the red brackets. When you set up a, a typical Enigma, you use a, a sheet much like this, which has the date in the leftmost column. In this particular version of this, uh, this sheet, you have uh, the reflector in the next column, the Umkehrwalzer. Then you have the order in which you insert the wheels from left, middle, and right, the Walzenlager, the Ringstellungen, which are the positions of the rings on the rotors, the Steckerverbindungen, which is the plugs at the front. Uh, typically, you would have only 10 of these, 10 plugs linking 20 positions. And the last column is the Kengruppen, which is not particularly crypto cryptographically significant. It's just used so that various networks can identify messages intended for them and conversely identify messages that they can ignore and not bother to try to decrypt. Uh, other criteria, are the machines included in my Enigma-like definition linguistically interesting? And are, otherwise, are they interesting enough to try to write a simulator? And I've written some simulators for some of the machines I'm going to talk about, and in other cases I'm using, I play with other people's simulators. So the first four, it's a fairly, it's a list of four machines that I'm going to go through fairly swiftly because uh, I've got much better things to talk about in the second group of four. So this is this machine known as the NEMBA which is just a short for Neue Maschine, which just means new machine in German. It's a Swiss machine. As far as I know, it's never seen active service. Um, it has 10 wheels, although in fact, what you're looking at is four rotors where the, left, the leftmost and the rightmost uh, rotors, so to speak, are the reflector and the entry wheel. And the middle eight rotors that you can see are in fact four rotors with the rings and the uh, wiring matrix parts separately rotating. So they form part of the uh, key setup. That's enough of that one. 
Next, we come to a Russian machine, which is kind of interesting. It's called a Fialka. Uh, it's known as a Fiowek in Polish. And uh, in 1976, the German Bundespost uh, put out a stamp with uh, uh, violets, the flower violet, pictures of, and the, the word Fialka or Fiowek in fact means uh, violet, as in the flower of that name. It has no fewer than 10 wheels, five of which step clockwise and five of which step counterclockwise. Instead of the plug board, it has a card. So there's no danger of getting the plugging wrong because you just slip a card in for the given day. And you can see this card has the number 23 just here, top left. I'm assuming you can see my mouse moving around. Um, so that would have been the 23rd for whatever month this, uh, this uh, card would have come from. The keyboard is uh, particularly scary. Uh, in that, as you can see, most of the keys have no fewer than four characters on them. And that is because these machines were made for use within the Warsaw Pact. So they all support Russian, and they generally also support one other country within the Warsaw Pact. And this one happens to be a Polish uh, version, but you'll, there's also a Czech version, a Hungarian version, and a German version. But you can see the Polish characters, for example, on this key here, there's the Z with the dot, and then there's A with a gonek, the little tail at the bottom, E with a gonek, L with a bar, and so on. So it can send messages either in Russian or in Polish. There's, um, it doesn't actually have a, a lamp board, but what it does have a, is a connector on the right-hand side, which looks like that. And I'd like to thank the Crypto Museum of, uh, of Eindhoven in the Netherlands for these pictures. So it, it's primarily a paper tape, five track in, five track out, although there's a keyboard. So the data you're getting out on this, this, this plug or this socket is five track data. But it's also used to control a power supply in that if the magnets don't fire for all the five tracks of the paper tape punch, which it's outputting its data on, then the power supply can simulate the operation of the magnets by providing its own dummy load. And it does that by referring to the data that's coming out on this socket. And this is a, a, an attempt to uh, implement Tempest uh, rules, shall we say, which, which reduces the, the uh, danger of somebody being able to analyze the power consumption and work out what characters are being punched because the, the power consumption is constant for all characters from one bit through, through to five bits. And that's what I just said. So five track tape, the, uh, the tracks are numbered S1 through S5 and they match the uh, the uh, picture on the paper tape up there. The, uh, the rotors are very much more complex in that the, uh, the, the wiring matrix is, uh, and the ring and the core in the center can be inserted in either direction. And the rotors can all be inserted in, in one of 10 positions. So it's rather more complex than Enigma. And the typical uh, coding sheet, if, if you can see the uh, five lines of uh, Russian Cyrillic at the bottom, those are the settings for one day. And they tell you how the wheels have to be set, how the wheels have to be positioned, wh wh whether the, uh, the line four tells you which way around the inside of the rotor is to be installed inside the outside of the rotor, and so on. Uh, this is a little bit by the by, but I did uh, create a system for uh, connecting a PC into that, that socket on the side and then monitoring the data in and monitoring the data out. Right, moving on. Type X, a British machine. Once again, I, th I thank uh, the, the gentleman in Eindhoven in uh, the Netherlands 
this is effectively an enigma with rather more uh, rather more wheels and a, a printer instead of a I'm sorry a tape punch instead of a, a keyboard it is sufficiently similar to Enigma that it could in fact be used to simulate Enigmas during the war. Um, there is a simulator in existence for it. Uh, one of my colleagues at the National Museum of Computing who goes by Virtual Colossus has a simulator online at typex.virtualcolossus.co.k. Then there's this rather a curious machine which I, which I found on a website and spoke to the uh, gentleman who knew all about it. It was possibly the same gentleman to whom Roger was recently referring. It's a, and it's an Enigma machine, which somehow has been uh, really cut up and heavily modified so that it has five wheels in the space of three. Um, the wheels are upside down because that's the only way they could make everything fit. Uh, this was documented by a gentleman called uh, Mariusz Grajek um, in, in Polish. I produced a translation in due course uh, five years later after I discovered this machine. Now we come to the machines I'm going to talk about in rather more detail. Firstly, the Polish Enigma, which is the same in machine, which in fact, which, is, uh, which I have in my background. <clears throat> this, although it's loosely called the Polish Enigma, it's a, it's, it's a machine created by or designed by Poles, and this particular machine was built by French engineers. This machine was in the Institute Józefa Piłsudskiego for Londynie um, until about uh, six months ago, and then they, uh, uh, they uh, sacrificed it for an exhibition in Poznań in uh, central Poland. It's much, it's much like a standard enigma, but when they created this, it was created for a mathematical convenience rather than total similarity with the, uh, with the real enigma. So instead of having, as you may have noticed earlier, the keyboard arranged in a German keyboard layout, it just has the keyboard arranged as A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on, all the way down to Z in the bottom right. The plug board, instead of being at the front below the keyboard, is at the back, and it has three wheels. Um, instead of having batteries inside the Enigma box, it runs on external power, 220 volts AC or 20 volts, uh, 20 volts DC, and where the battery should have gone, they've placed the two rotors which aren't being used. So this was a five rotor machine of which you would select three to make it function. The rotors effectively match the German Enigma. One, two, and three match German Enigma. Four and five happen to have an offset of one. And the uh, reflector is always reflector B. And this is uh, some rather old grainy pictures. You can see top left, there's a two sockets for 20 volts and 220 volts, rather worryingly, uh, a rather worrying looking 220 volt socket, which presumably has a, a somewhat dangerous 220 volt plug going into it. Um, and there's a switch top right, which switches between the two and to right of that is some bulb testing uh, um, sockets. which I've just highlighted now. So you have the uh, power sockets on the left and the uh, switch to switch between the 20 and 220 volts on the right there. Now let's move to another machine. We're, we're drifting away from Enigma, total Enigma-like machines. And I'm going to talk a bit about this machine, which is, I claim, Enigma-like, and it certainly seems to work a bit like an Enigma. It has four wheels. The wheels are numbered rather than lettered. So there's uh, 25 positions on each wheel. And below that, there's a lamp board in which you can see some scary looking Japanese characters. And below that, there's a plug board 
uh, so there's a keyboard, excuse me, which shows one set of scary looking Japanese characters in black and one set of scary looking Japanese characters in red. The, the uh, display, the lamp, the lamp board between the rotors and the keyboard can in fact be switched to show either the black uh, key characters or the red key characters. So how does this machine work? We're going to get into a bit of uh, linguistics now. Generally speaking on this planet, there are three systems of writing. You can either use an alphabet such as we do and such as they use in Greece and such as they do in countries such as Russia and Ukraine. And the bottom line is Hebrew, which is not technically an alphabet, but it's close enough for my purposes. Then you can use what is called a syllabary, which is a representation of every possible syllable of a language using a unique character for each one. And you have one character per consonant times vowel. And they're relatively rare compared with uh, alphabets. If you if you want, if you were interested in creating one for English, you write all the consonants along the top. And I've taken the liberty of including Y as a consonant and all the vowels down the left. And I've here included Y as a vowel. So now you can put a character in each of these boxes and you end up with 132 characters for each syllable. So syllabary is always somewhat larger than alphabets. This is an example of, of um, a syllabary that is used in Nunavut in Canada. And you can see along the top the consonants and down the left hand side the vowels. But let's get back to Japanese because that's the main thrust of this machine. There's what is called a square syllabary, which are also known as katakana. And on the, the main box top right shows the basic forms of all the characters as a syllabary in the syllabary. Um, so you go rightmost column downwards. So it reads a i u e o kaki ku ke ko sa shi su se so and so on. And then you and you go horizontally once you've done each column. There is a, a mnemonic which one learns when one is studying Japanese, which is a, a kind samurai told Naomi how my yak ran wild, which tells you you start with the vowels and then you go through the syllables that start with K and then the syllables that start with S and then with T and so on. So that covers 51 basic characters of which 20 can then take um, a little double tick uh, and five of them can take a little circle. So that allows the uh, production of further syllables. Ha with a double tick comes out as ba and ha with a little circle comes out as pa. There is another syllabary, the cursive syllabary, uh, which is not in use on this machine. It's basically the same set of characters or the, the, the same possible characters, but with a, with a fundamentally different way of writing them. The katakana, the square ones, are primarily used for foreign words, sometimes for Japanese company names. Um, in Japanese comics, robots and monsters and the like will often speak in katakana to emphasize their foreignness, to emphasize their weird weirdness. The hiragana are used for grammatical endings for Japanese words for which no kanji, which I'll come to in a moment, exist, and for grammatical particles, for example, in the conjugation of verbs and uh, the pluralization of nouns and so on. Uh, this is an example of uh, an Epson advertisement, which is something like 12 years old now. And once you know katakana, you can actually read something like two thirds of this without actually knowing any Japanese. So for example, uh, this character, this string here says downrodo, download. And this character 
down here says uh, Rogu in login, and here is Password. And you can you can just by translating the characters into English without actually knowing Japanese, you can you can actually say see that this one says Purinta, and so on. So when I've given this talk in the past. Uh, when I've been emphasizing this machine more, I've actually gone off for a cup of tea and left people with this picture on the screen for five minutes, uh, having it and invite them to try and work out what, as many of the uh, English words and phrases as they could. But we won't do that here, because some of you have trains to catch. Now, the final type of uh, writing that's used in Japanese, Chinese, and even ancient Egyptian. It's what are called ideograms. Um, I was rather delighted once to discover that the uh, tale of Peter Rabbit had in fact been converted into Egyptian hieroglyphs. And uh, you can see the, the picture in the box near the bottom. Uh, the tale is a, a primarily a picture of a man speaking. He's got his hand out and there's words coming out of his mouth. Uh, there's a picture of a rabbit on the right, which is, since they don't have rabbits in Egypt, it's actually a, an Egyptian hare, but close enough. Uh, all the kanji that are used in Japanese are available in this, uh, this book of mine, which is falling apart with lots of use. And it tells you that, for example, if I consider just two kana, ke and i, kei, then this converts to many different kanji. So all of these characters, all of these large um, ornate characters are all pronounced kei. So there's something of a one-way trap here because you can convert this character into kei and you can convert this character into kei. But if you are confronted with the character pair kei, then you don't actually know which of the characters in this column, it converts back to. And I've just shown you one page, but there's something like three pages of these characters, all of which are pronounced K. So a puzzle then arises, which is uh, if you've got a, a crypto machine that only uses Kana, it's easy enough to convert the kanji, the, the main Japanese characters, into Kana. But the reverse process is quite impossible because you have no idea which of possibly 20 or 30 characters was originally meant. And as far as I know, the reason how this system works is in fact, you don't really transmit Japanese using this machine. But what you do do is you convert your Japanese using a code book into, into Kana. So a word for battleship wouldn't actually be the Japanese word for battleship. It would be some set of four Kana, which only ever mean battleship. So let's get back to this machine. The highlighted two keys there are shift keys. You'll notice there's a red one with a character that looks a bit like an upward pointing arrow. And below that, there's a black one, which is a character which looks a bit like a downward pointing arrow. And that tells you basically upper shift and lower shift. And each key has a red character in the upper shift and a black character in the lower shift. And this picture is clearly set in the lower shift position, because if you look at the character here, this uh, thing that looks a bit like a arrowhead pointing upper right, it matches the character on this key here. And this one matches the character here and so on. Now, I would rather have liked to have been able to play with such a machine, but that wasn't actually feasible. There aren't that many. And those that are uh, under lock and key in uh, various museums in the US primarily. So I uh, found myself writing a simulator, as you do. Um, one little thing I would mention down here, you'll notice I've got a little Morse box. Um, although, of course, crypto machines don't of themselves generally send Morse. I, I add a Morse function to my, the simulators I produce. And you'll see this character here. Um, if you know Morse, you'll know it's not actually a regular Morse character. And that is because 
Japanese Morse is rather more complex because you're dealing with something like 50 or 60 characters in the Kana set. You therefore need rather more Morse characters than exist in the standard 26 letter and five uh, and 10 number Morse. So the, the Japanese character a uh, is dash dash dot dash dash and i is dot dash, which confusingly is the standard letter for a. U, U as it happens is U, and E is dash dot dash dash dash, which is one of the longer characters, even though E in the standard Morse is one of the shortest characters possible. Now, getting back to this, I've put together a little demo. Uh, Rogu in. How would you in encrypt this word Rogu in on this machine? So, First of all, you have to find the characters on the keyboard. And the first character is Ro, which is this square character here, which is an upper shift character. So the first thing I have to do is to go to upper shift. Then I can actually type in the Ro character and I get the character for O. Next character I want to do is Gu. Now, as it happens, Gu, is not a standard kana, it's a kana with an extra accent. So first of all, I have to find ku, which is here, which is a lower shift character. So now I have to switch the, the uh, shift down. And then I do ku and I get yo. But actually I wanted to encrypt ku. So the next thing I have to do is to use either this zero key or this one key as an accent marker. As it happens, the one is an upper shift. So once again, back to upper shift, and then I send a one, and that comes out as a raw. And then you work your way through the four characters that, of the message until you end up with the five character response, the five character encryption version. So rogu in, first of all, has to be expanded to roku, and then one, and in, and then that eventually gets encrypted to o, yo, ro, shi, uh, ro, uh, ri. Or your role, she re. Then, of course, you can reverse the process just by resetting the wheels and typing in the uh, encrypted message back again, and you end up with the original text. Um, you end up with the five characters. Rocko in. Here we go. Rocko one in. And then, as you receive it, you have to say, "Okay, I've got this one. Therefore, I need to apply the accent mark." To the character before it, so this ku becomes ku. Next up, Hebrew enigma. Now, this may look somewhat familiar because it's actually a German enigma which has been modified to work in Hebrew. There are approximately 30 of them in Israel. Uh, a colleague of mine who uh, happened to be curating an exhibition in Israel, asked, he knew that there were Enigma system, Enigma machines in Israel, but he didn't know anything about them. They sent the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, sent him one for this exhibition. And when he got it and opened it up, he was astonished to discover Hebrew characters on the keyboard, on the plug board at the front, and also on the lamp board at the top. And this was completely unexpected. So there is 26 keys, but there are only 22 Hebrew characters in the Hebrew character set. Uh, that's not quite accurate because if you look at this um, scan of the Hebrew characters, there are in fact 27 characters, but some of them are long forms, uh, end of word forms for the standard characters. So if you have the letter K in the middle of a word or the beginning of a word, it would look like this. But if it happens to be the last character of a word, then it comes out looking like this. So you have standard cuff and cuff soffit, as it's called in Hebrew, or indeed langer cuff, as it's called in Yiddish. And that applies to M, N, P, and 
uh, what is effectively a Z. Now, you don't want to be encrypting the long characters differently from the regular characters, because then that gives a clue to anybody who's trying to understand the messages that, that, where it would point out where some of the word endings are. So in fact, you don't have these five long uh, uh, characters on the keyboard. So now you've got uh, four characters which aren't being, four keys which aren't being used. You have to put something on those keys on a 26 uh, letter machine. Otherwise you'd have to completely remodify, completely modify, completely with new rotors to only accept 22 characters. And what you actually have are the letters F, V, X, and Y. And those of us who were looking at this machine at the time were rather puzzled as to why F, V, X and Y, out of all the 26 letters of the, uh, of the Latin alphabet, why those four characters? But somebody eventually pointed out that Morse in Hebrew uses Latin equivalent Morse. So you can see the uh, first character Aleph is, is approximately equivalent to the Latin letter A, and it uses the Morse for A, dot dash. Uh, the letter Beth uses equivalent B and is Morse B. So you've now gone through 22 of the Morse codes. And the four that don't exist in this list, because they don't exist in equivalent form of Hebrew, are F, V, X, and Y. So that's why F, V, X, and Y appear on the keyboard, on the lamp board, and on the plug board. The keys are approximately arranged in the order of uh, Hebrew uh, keyboard. The F is top left, the X and Y are further down the uh, top row on the right, and the V is bottom left. Uh, simulator time. This time I'm going to encrypt the, um, the, um, the, the nice uh, Hebrew greeting, Shalom which you, you might imagine is six letters, but actually it's only four in Hebrew. So I've set my wheels and then I start to type. First character is sh, shin, which curiously looks rather like the Cyrillic letter of the same, uh, the same name, but it's encrypted to an F. Then we have a lameth, L, which is encrypted to an X. We have a vav, which is encrypted to a g or a gimel. And then the final m is encrypted to a d, dalet. And of course, this process is also reversible. So I set the wheels back again and type in fx, g, d, fx, g, d. And I end up with a shalom again, the first, the, these four characters here. Um, this character is actually a V, but it's quite often used to represent a vowel. Uh, Hebrew is uh, interesting in that the vowels, although clearly it has vowels in the language, they are quite often not written. Um, they are sometimes marked for children and religious texts as little accent marks above or below various consonants. So you actually have S H L V M, where the V would be a uh, normally uh, would, could take an accent indicating that it's an O. Now we come to an interesting legend which, is, uh, which, uh, which follows this story. The legend Ha'agada, Ha'agada, excuse me. The, um, the British offered the Israeli Defense Force in the nascent state of uh, Israel some Enigma machines. They just said, hey, we got some um, Enigma machines that you might like to use while you're wanting to send uh, secret messages internally. So they offered uh, 30 machines to the Israeli Defense Force. Um, neglecting to uh, inform the Israelis at that time, and I, it's, I must point out this is a legend. It's not known if this is true or not, but it's a fairly commonly circulated story. Uh, the legend goes on that they hadn't told the uh, Israeli Defense Force that actually they'd cracked Enigma, 
some years earlier, because we're, we're talking 1946 or seven or so. So the uh, IDF were happy to accept them and immediately began the task of converting them into Hebrew. And some texts also say into Arabic as well. When you say conversion, of course, it is just a matter of changing key tops and changing the legends on the lamp board and the, the plug board. It's not known if they've rewired them, because although my colleague in this, who was curating this exhibition had one of these machines in his hands, he was definitely not allowed to take the pieces or even look at the serial numbers. So it's not even sure where these machines came from originally. Um, the machines were all set and ready to go into operation until something strange happened. A Bletchley Park mathematician who was Jewish immigrated to Israel and became a maths professor. And he found out from one of his students that the idea had received these 30 machines. Um, of course, this British, math, this British Jewish mathematician knew that he, amongst other people, had broken Enigma. So he then dropped this hint. He dropped this hint that said, have you heard of the Trojan horse? And this student immediately went to David Ben-Gurion, as you would, and said, I think there's something fishy about these enigmas. So after they converted them, they never used them. Moving swiftly on, I think I'm still in a reasonable time. So you're going to get all eight. The Poles had no uh, encryption systems of their own during the war, so they decided to invent one, which, in, it, which has, goes by about three names, one of which is La Chida, one of which is LCD, and one of which is LCP. So let's get this La Chida out of the way. It is believed that LA stands for Guido Langer, who was one of the people involved in its construction. The Chi is Maximilian Cienczki. And the Da is either Ludomir Danilevich or his brother Leonard Danilevich, for whom there is no photograph. <clears throat> but sometimes this machine is called an, has a pa instead of a da in which case the P or the PA might stand for Antony Palut. These were all people who were involved in the engineering of this machine. Now it's kind of an unusual machine and I'm going to go through the unusualnesses. First of all, it's a typewriter. It's primarily a Remington typewriter with a with the, uh, with the uh, crypto wheels in a box on the front. And it has, somewhat unusually, a switch for encipherment and decipherment. So it's either, this machine's going to be either in chiffre mode or dechiffre mode. And I'll come to why that is in a moment. Uh, this is a Polish, uh, a Polish uh, version which says much the same thing. Slightly better picture of the box. You can see there's three wheels in here sticking out, but there's actually three more wheels inside which are not adjustable except by unlocking the box and opening it and then, then locking the box again when you're through. Now here's the wiring diagram. And the behavior is different depending on whether you're encrypting or decrypting, which is why there's an encryption decryption option. So during encipherment, only 24 characters are accessible. So you can see this dotted line here is boxing off two characters from the top row, the Q and the V, and the, and the numbers one through nine. 
Now, bearing in mind this machine was going to be used for encrypting Polish, not having queue is not a problem because Polish doesn't have a queue, and foreign words which are imported into Polish that begin with QU are normally transliterated into KW anyway. They also, Polish doesn't use the letter V. If you want a letter V, you actually use the letter W to pronounce uh, V. So you have the remaining 24 letters come through here into a rotor with 24 positions. And then 24 is converted to 24. But then the next wheel has 24 wires in and 31 out. And then 31 and 31, then 31 and 35, then 35 and 35, 35 all the way through. So the 24 letter input message has been converted into a 35 letter or 35 character output message. In decryption mode, the uh, data goes in the opposite direction. In decryption mode, all of the keys are available. And now you, can, you have a 35 letter or 35 letter and number combined crypto message, which you're sending backwards through this morass to get back to the original 24 characters. <clears throat> now let's compare this with Enigma. Three rotor Enigma has three rotors used twice in the sense that you have current flowing from right to left and then from left to right. Whereas the Lakshida has six rotors. So, so far so equivalent. The Enigma has a reflector. And one of the, one of the effects of the reflector is that no key can encrypt to itself. Lachida does not have a reflector, so a character can encrypt to itself, which means the little slide rule that you, uh, you've probably all seen in the bomb room, which allows you to work out whether or not, or where a crib positions relative to the crypto text doesn't work anymore because you cannot just say this position can't work because there's a matching character in the crib in the crypto text. Enigma wheels have 26 possible star positions. <clears throat> so for the three, you have 26 cubed, which is 17,576. Lachida has 24, 31, and 35 possible starting positions, giving a uh, 989 million possible star positions, which is an improvement of approximately 56,000 over Enigma. However, the Lashi does not, does not have a plug board. So the 56 odd thousand improvement in wheel positions is only approximately equal to two cables, just uh, slightly better than two cables, certainly less good than three, three cables. So just doing these crude numbers, the Lachida, although it looks impressive, is actually less, uh, uh, has fewer uh, encryption possibilities. And because there's no reflector, you now have to have a cipher decipher switch. The thing about Enigma is that, and most of the other machines I showed you, is that you don't need, uh, because they have a reflector, you don't need a cipher decipher switch because you can just type the wheel, uh, put the wheels back into the original positions where the message was sent, and you end up uh, decrypting rather than encrypting. Uh, Three rotor Enigma can have the rotors installed in one of six positions. Lachida, you can't actually take the wheels out and move them around because you've got these wheels of all sorts of different sizes and so you can't mix them and match them. Um, and this is just effectively saying the same thing. So that means that most of the things on this, uh, on this uh, coding sheet, there's no reflector, so that column doesn't work. The wheels are fixed in order, so this column doesn't work. The wheels don't have rings, so this column doesn't work. There's no plug board, so this column doesn't work. So there's almost no applicability of any of these variability variants. Uh, in summer 41, Polish intelligence chiefs decided that the cryptologists, their own cryptologists, should verify the resistance of the Lachida cipher machine against cryptanalytic crypton analytic efforts. So Ryevsky and uh, Marian Ryevsky and Henrik Sigalski received for testing some messages that had been enciphered on the Lachida. 
And it is claimed that without ever having seen the machine, they were still able to decrypt them in less than two hours. And clearly the resulting consternation was considerable. Right, the last demo. Um, okay. I'm just going to briefly introduce a little algorithm called the um, Index of Coincidence, which was uh, created by uh, William Friedman and, and is uh, written up in the uh, Riverbank publications, which is basically a way of uh, determining the randomness of a data string, or indeed the non-randomness of a data string. And it's a mathematical algorithm you can apply to a string of characters to see if it's random or indeed if it's a natural language and indeed you can determine what natural language the 26 standard 26 character text has been written in so there's a, a magic number for english a magic number for french a magic number for german and so on now i wanted to check that my simulator would work and produce random text in the 35 character output Remember, there was 26 letters of the alphabet and nine numbers of the alpha, uh, nine digits in the output stream, making a total of 35 characters. And indeed, for a flat distribution, the, uh, the index of coincidence for a flat distribution of 35 characters is 0 0.0286. That's just uh, uh, re emphasizing the keyboard layout. The, uh, keys the top row and two of the letters there are used in decryption mode only so n in, in encryption mode only you only get to use those characters now you'll notice that there's only latin letters on this keyboard and as it happens uh, polish has a plethora of accented characters so there's a with a gonic and c with an acute accent e a gonic and so on and these are actually significant because for example this e with the hook distinguishes it could distinguish between um, a first person and a third person singular verb and the a uh, can distinguish between a feminine noun in the accusative or uh, sorry in the uh, genitive or the nominative so you actually need these characters but they're not on the keyboard so I'm not sure how they actually took care of that, but I, I proposed a theory, which no one's objected to yet. Consider I wanted to encrypt this message. To jest ważna wiadomostja. This is an important message. You'll see the Z has a dot, and the terminal S and C both have acute accents. Now I've borrowed from another language which was created in Poland, Esperanto. And Esperanto has a number of accented characters which aren't that easy to um, uh, operate on a standard typewriter. So they have this system known as the X system, whereas accented characters are followed by the letter X. So instead of to jest ważna wiadomostja, after the Z there's an X, after the S there's an X, and after the C there's an X. Uh, I, I've discussed this with some Polish people and they haven't said that's not how it might have worked and this is only a theory anyway so they've been polite enough to say it's probably all right it's not too bad so a quick i'm going to speed up with this a little bit um in cipher i'm going to type hello h e l l l o and that has come out as x a six p c and then I've reset the wheels back to their original setting. And now I'm going, I'm now in, in typing in the crypto text XA6EP, and it's returned it back to the 24 characters of the original text. Now they, they made a number of these machines, even if they didn't use them. And one question arises is, um, where are the Lacidas Lachidis? that she does today and the same goes for the cyclometers and the bombers that the poles created as part of their uh, enigma breaking exercise now on this map 
you can see a picture, um, a diagram of the escape of the Poles from Germany when they're being pursued by the, by the enemy of the day. Uh, on the 6th of November in the evening, they left uh, the town just to the south of Warsaw, known as Piri, and they went east and east and east as far as Brescia. And then they started to turn south and turn south to the town of Wusk. That's L with a bar U C K. They then went a little bit west to the, the town of Ushwug. Um, I'm showing you this picture thanks to the uh, Institute Josefa Piłsudskiego. But this picture also appears in Dermot Turing's book, uh, The Real Story of How Enigma Was Broken, also known as Pravjiva Historia Zwamania Shifru Enigma, and also available in French. And this is a modern map of the area. Here we have Wusk, which has now actually all note been written in Latin letters and in Cyrillic letters. And this is the route they took. I imagine the H22 didn't exist then. And here we have Ustiwug, which is now known as Ustiluch. And you'll notice the Cyrillics. That's because this area is in Ukraine. I think it was in Poland at the time, but now it's in Ukraine. So somewhere in a field in somewhere in Ukraine, there is probably a place where they threw everything in a hole in the ground and set fire to it. And maybe some of that stuff has survived and it would be interesting to go over there with a spade and have a dig around, but it's probably under a car park now or a housing, uh, housing area or some such. I'm planning one day to do a little more work on, on the, uh, studying in the uh, Lichita which is to see if you can create either a machine like this, the cyclometer or indeed the Womba. And there's further reading available in three publications by a gentleman called Christoph Guy. Some of these are in English and some of these are not. And incidentally, he's now a professor of mathematics in the USA. So he, uh, you can find him online. And that uh, completes my talk. Thank you very much. I can't hear anything from anybody. <laughs> no, so, sorry, it, uh, we needed just a moment to uh, unmute the microphones in here. OK. Um, OK, uh, questions um, from the uh, questions. I don't know if there's any in the room. I don't immediately see a hand. Uh, are there questions online that uh, people would like to put? If you unmute, uh, you can speak. Um, I can Hello? see. Yes. Hello. Yes. It's a, it's a very minor thing, actually. But I, I, I was one of the things I was expecting you to show. But I know it's very simple in comparison. Is uh, the Boris Hagelin machine, which sort of is, is a, about fifteen years earlier, I think, um, which uh, I, I was the first Enigma-like machine, if you can call it that. And I know it's very simple. It's the first one I ever came across. Well, so that I, doesn't I that doesn't actually work with wired rotors, does it? That's a Pl plugs and pins machine well that, but yeah that, that's right i mean i i realized perhaps with your cri i was looking for this in advance i think when i saw your criteria i began to think well perhaps you wouldn't do that <laughs> no that's right yeah. that's right yeah. yes yeah um, i mean what's interesting about that machine is that it's um it's what unix uses its first encryption algorithm oh okay <laughs> Um, yeah, the Unix crypt algorithm has actually got a if you look in the source code has got uh, arrays called will one will two will three and so on Anyway, oh, enough okay. of that, but yeah, yeah. Oh, fascinating, thank you. <laughs> oh, some, uh, we, we have some uh, comments in the chat. Uh, Gavin B, um, would you like to ask your question? If you unmute. Would it be easier if I just read it? Uh, yes, if you, yeah, by all means. How important do you think it is to teach the Enigma machine? Is understanding it valuable to fields outside just cryptography? Uh, I'm not sure I have an answer. Well, I, I certainly think it's important to teach the Enigma machine. I don't know that it has much significance outside of uh, 
cryptography, but that's just a personal opinion. Uh, right. Oh, Gavin says he doesn't have a microphone. <laughs> ah, oh, well, that explains the, the silence. It's, it's the um, silence, yes. Um, I, ha I have a few questions, please. Sir, yes, yes. So where you go, Mario. Yes. So in the Enigma machine, how many wires for the plugs do we have? Have the number of characters? Like every character should be plugged to another character? Typically, you would only use 10. Um, in theory, you could have 13 cables linking every one to every other one. But in practice, okay. 10 were used. Okay. And another question, please. Uh, the Japanese machine, there is a like uh, a turn on button, maybe on the bottom right. What is it for? It is written like six volts and 45 volts. What is this? It's a switch to turn it on or well, what is this? Um, I, I have to say, I don't actually know what that is. Um, because oh, I was yeah, more interested in the uh, electronics and the uh, and the cryptography than the power okay. supply. It's just by curiosity, no problem. Uh, and the uh, last question: uh, so we don't know the Hebrew machine if it is transformed, if it is a transformed German machine, or it is a replica like the British built it as a replica of the German machine. We don't know, or it's uh, literally a German Enigma machine that is transformed to Hebrew. Um, as far as is known, they are German machines that were captured. There's a theory uh -huh. that they actually came from Norway, where they were captured in Norway and then supplied to Israel, but that's, uh, that's only a theory. Oh, okay. Excellent, very clear. Thanks so much for the presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. I've got a I couple of... A... Ah, sorry, I have a couple of questions in the room. Uh, Dan Hayton and... Uh, oh, would you like, sorry, uh, Donald, would you like to pass it that way? Thanks. Okay, hello, my name's Donald Bell. Um, if the IDF had accepted the Enigma machines that were given to them, did the British continue to have the ability to crack them? Because I thought that a lot of the Colossus and other machines were actually broken up at the end of the war. Well, actually, Colossus is irrelevant to Enigma. <laughs> But you, but you probably meant bomb machines, really. Um, and the, the story is indeed they were destroyed at the end of the war. But in practice, if they hadn't made all the errors of using stereotyped messaging and uh, messages in depth and so on, they would have been less crackable anyway. I didn't think that all of the bombs were actually broken up. That may well be the case. Uh, until such time as uh, computing facilities existed to mm. make electronic, uh, computerized uh, bomb. Not my area of expertise, but I think that's the story, shall we say. Dan. But, uh, there is a theory that the Foreign Office made uh, Enigma type machines, or indeed Enigma machines, available to a lot of the emerging Commonwealth independent countries. And this was simply so that we could read what they were talking about, um, which is a cynical way of looking at it, but possibly true. The other point I would make is that I was at a meeting at the IEE when it was still the IEE, and someone in the audience stood up and talked about using a Colossus in the 1950s and was immediately pounced upon by various people uh, to enlarge on what she'd said. Uh, but I'd never heard the end of that story because she was whisked away to be in interrogated in a separate room. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, yes, a car outside with black windows, yes. And um, men in sunglasses, yes. Yes. Um, Jerry, can I ask you a question? Um, you, you, you showed us the sort of family tree of oh, yes. the um, Enigma machines. Um, do all of the machines that you showed um, also track back, in a sense, to 
possibly to the commercial Enigma machines, um, even if people uh, didn't, do, uh, the, the, their sort of development started um, in, paramo, in, in parallel with the Wehrmacht uh, activities. Um, or do you think some of these may have been uh, sort of independently inspired? I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of countries, well, a lot, um, a number of countries were working on wheeled device hmm. encoding yes. devices. Uh, are you able to give us at least some sense of a family tree of, of where these track back to? Well, the, the, um, the family tree I showed is primarily, uh, well, it, it is in fact, they're all derived from the, uh, from the commercial machines. So it doesn't cover machines created in other countries or in, in other... Uh, uh, no, I, I'd realized that it, it yes. was really asking whether the, the other machines you described, it, it, whether there is a sort of family tree of where ideas came from? Well, not really my area of expertise. No, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I see Mr. Randall uh, has, a, has a hand up. Oh, yes, right, Brian. Hi, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, um, my attention was caught when you made a brief mention of, a, I think you call it a cyclometer. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, um, Perhaps I'm misremembering, but I thought that was the name used for the device um, that the Poles used as part of their breaking of, of, of Enigma. That is correct, yes. Okay, and is, and, and is that what you were talking about when you said that? Yes, the, ah. they created two, two major systems, the cyclometer and the bomber, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. some subsidiary systems mm -hmm. such as Zygalski sheets and so on, ah. so they're all within that family. The Matoda Tsigara. Oh, okay, it's just that I thought uh, you were implying that the cyclometer itself was a um, an Enigma-like device used for, uh, you know, for encryption, so to speak. No, it's an uh, it was um, a device which, of course, functioned had internal wiring which was consistent mm -hmm. with Enigma, but it was used for creating uh, catalogs of. Uh, well, a catalog system of what were so-called females on, mm -hmm. and also a cyclic uh, uh, cycles through the, um, through the wiring matrix of the machine at various um, positions of the wheels. Uh, one final comment rather than a, a, a question, really for your amusement. This was to the, a number of years ago at Newcastle, um, we had a project which very fairly carefully investigated um, acoustic side channel attacks on the Enigma. Um, uh, in other words, um, trying to determine whether um, one could detect the different noises made by the different keys when uh, they were pressed, uh, what was being pressed. And the answer was yes, really quite easily. Hmm. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> but it was a fun thing to have the students do. Uh, I still remember them queuing up to do, uh, uh, to uh, um, you know, essentially do a, a, a trial um, uh, pressing of uh, some standard text, and quite a large number of them doing that. Uh, it, it was fun. Hmm. Thanks, Brian. Uh, other que other questions that, that uh, people would like to put. There's a couple more in the chat for that matter. Okay, yes, the, towards the end. Do you want to deal with those, Jerry? Certainly. Um, where shall I start? Where shall I start? Yes, okay. Um, do I mean that Polish characters can only be either unaccented or have one type of accent? Um, there's something like eight Polish characters which can either be accented or unaccented. And one of those characters, which is the letter Z, I can have one of two accents, if that answers your question. Uh, Mr. Sillars, okay. Mm. Yeah, that, that answers the question. It was just that you were using an X to show that it was an accent, and I wondered yes. if it was just one kind of accent. Yes, well, it's, all, it's awkward that, because I then have to extend my theory by using two Xs <laughs> in one particular case. 
Um, Gem Taylor, perhaps the four Latin keys on the IDF machine were to allow Latin words to be interpolated. Well, you could do that, but you couldn't write very much using just the four letters, although you could, uh, in, you could use them perhaps for punctuation or something like that. Uh, let, let me be clearer. Uh, my idea was that um, you showed that there's a read across between the um, lettering, the, the um, Israeli alphabet and the Latin alphabet for those characters that lie on the keyboard. But if you had a Latin word, which you needed to spell in, you could spell it in, you, you, it's obvious which the A would be, but if you needed to type a Latin word, which had one of the four additional characters in it, you ah, could yes. use the four additional characters. Mm. Yes, I mean, that, that is indeed a possibility, but since they never used them, they never produced an operating manual for the machine, or if they did, I don't think they ever escaped the, uh, <laughs> escaped to the, into the wild. There were, it has been said uh, that at the time of the Suez Crisis in 1956, that the British were reading um, uh, Enigma messages. Um, did you think that A, is that a sort of um, urban myth deriving from the British providing IDF with Enigma machines, or is it possible they were reading Egyptian messages, given the relationship previously between Egypt and the UK? Uh, had the British also <laughs> supplied the Egyptians uh, with Enigma machines? That's entirely possible, but it's not a not a story that's come my way. Bearing in mind, these uh, Israeli machines only came to light completely by accident when the uh, when the Israeli Defense Force loaned my colleague a model, and it wasn't until he took the lid off that he realized what he had. Right. C could I ask you a, a question? You showed us um, a, 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 a if what I took might have been at the one of the Polish created reverse engineered Enigma machines. Yes. Um, now, as I recollect, the Poles built 12 in Poland, um, and then uh, a further number were built, I think, in France. Yes. Uh, after the Poles joined up with uh, Bertrand and company uh, in, uh, in, in France and then uh, in Vichy, France. Um, it, is that the, the machine that was in... Uh, well, I, I, I think you said is the property of um, the uh, Institute in Kensington, but is on loan to an exhibition in Poznan. Is that one of the French uh, reverse, en uh, reverse engineered machines built to the Polish design, or yeah. is it something else? Yes, actually the, the machine, um, indeed it was in the Sikorsky Institute in Kensington, but it's been in the Pilsudski Institute in Hammersmith for several years. But now it's actually in, went to Warsaw and then uh, onwards to Poznan. And I'm not sure it's a loan, actually. I think they might have been persuaded to give it up. But yes, it's one of the French machines. Uh, it does actually have one word of French text written on the, uh, on the top where the power supply is, where it says uh, control, which is the light bulb testing uh, socket. Right. Um, it, I, I, one of the uh, in, in enduring things you were showing De, the cover of Dermot Turing's book XYZ, um, uh, Dermot describes uh, the arrival in, 19, in August 39 um, on the Golden Arrow of uh, a reverse engineered Polish Enigma machine um, mm. arriving at Victoria Station to be greeted by uh, the head of MI5 in uh, evening dress since he was on his way to dinner. Um, uh, that must have been a wonderful sight. I mean, nobody would have known, apart from a very small number, what was happening. But uh, the diplomatic bag being collected, um, uh, I, I, I have to say, it is something that I would have dearly give, dearly liked to see. It must, must have been an extraordinary moment for those who knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. I see a couple of uh, attendees with their hands up. Uh, yes, I 
you mentioned that the Polish machine was essentially a Remington typewriter. Um, oh, yes. Well, if the if the whole mechanism was essentially electrical, how how was the typewriter? How were the keys pressed internally? Would would did they have electromagnets on each key or something? Do you have any idea? No, because um, no one's ever seen one of these machines. There's only the, the picture I showed, or the two pictures I showed, are pretty much the only images available. And everything has had, has had to have been mentally reverse engineered from those two pictures. But so how do you know it was a Remington typewriter, essentially? Well, that's somewhat, that is in some of the documentation that survived, but um, there's no explanation as to how it had been modified to drive, to drive the wheels and so on. But they would have had to have had to have added extra uh, electrics to turn the to step the wheels and to take the output from the keyboard and through the wheels and then into the actual type type head and so on. Yes. So there's no so idea how they did that. No. We we can only guess. So that well, would be pretty early electrical type electric typewriter if it did yes. if it did work like that then. Thank you. May I invite Mr. Simpson to? Uh... Thank you, Jerry. Uh, great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. I, I just have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is uh, in the discussion about the use of the uh, bombs after the war. Um, I'm not exactly sure, uh, you know, what the status was in in England there, but in the U.S., um, it's been, uh, you know, revealed that uh, the bombs that uh, the U.S. had, which were built specifically to break the four-wheel enigma, but could also break the three-wheel enigma. They were in use until 1955. And the last bomb run uh, that was done in 1955, that bomb is on display in, uh, in Bletchley Park, I mean, in, uh, in uh, Fort Meade, uh, the yes. USA Museum there. And uh, so you can, you can see that, that specific bomb. And uh, uh, they, the U.S. claims they've destroyed the rest of them, but there's rumors that some of the others are still in existence somewhere. Um, so th that was just the comment. The, uh, the other is, I was wondering what you thought of uh, the Hebron machine, you know, which was very similar to the commercial Enigma, I would say, except the first version only had one wheel, but they eventually came up with up to five wheels. And this was built by Edward Hebron, uh, just up the street from me here in uh, uh, Oakland, California. So I was just wondering what you thought of that machine as an Enigma-like machine. Well, I don't actually know that machine particularly well, so I can't really say what I think of it. I'll, I'll have to do some reading. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's not uh, there's not a lot of them left, but there is one at the uh, um, NSA Museum, you know, in Fort Meade. And uh, the first version of it only had one wheel. And interestingly, it didn't have a reflector or anything. So to decode, you uh, took that wheel out and reversed it, <laughs> put it okay. in in reverse order, and then that's how you decoded it. Uh, but later versions had up to five wheels. And... Uh, and this uh, actually was invented uh, the year before the uh, patent date of the Enigma. So it's a very early machine that uh, used the wired rotors, um, you know, just like the Enigma machine did. It's called the Hebron. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Did I ask uh, a repeat question? Uh, were these machines as crackable as the original? Uh, which machines are you referring to? Well, all the variants. I mean, the, we we cracked the original Enigma. Would we have been able to crack these machines? We we cracked um, th some, a few models of the Enigma on that tree, but I don't know which way in time you're you're going with your question. Well, at, at the time, and we were able to read the Enigma story i mean that's really where the ultra you know the ultra story came from yes. if these other machines were in use could we have applied the same techniques you mean the other machines i was describing yes oh okay well uh, you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able to use exactly the same bombs or anything but in theory if if the same mistakes were being used on the other machines, such as sending keys twice, so thereby effectively sending parts of messages in depth, then eventually they are all crackable. Right. Thank you. And, 
and and also there's the stereotype um, stereotype messages where you send like the equivalent of weather forecast at the beginning of every message from a weather ship then that sort of thing is susceptible to crackage no no matter what you do it on i speak generally here one would think that cribs would give you the same opportunities uh, it, it's not sufficient but it would be a significant step towards breaking those machines quite so yes quite so and um, if this if the israelis hadn't used a repetitive you know crib cribbable messages that they might might have been perfectly safe after all back on america about uh, bombs i seem to remember there was an ncr bomb in the smith quite some years ago in the where the Smithsonian institute Smithsonian. In washington. yeah in washington uh, in washington essentially the science museum in the states um i wonder if that's the same one that's now in the nsa museum which is only a few tens of miles away yeah possibly hmm. many years since i've been to either place hmm. right i think this is probably the point at which we thank jerry very much for uh, a very interesting insight into the enigma uh, uh, machine family uh, the various relatives uh, and uh, i wish you all well and i hope very much to see many of you uh, in a month's time for uh, the uh, april lecture on max newman and computing thank you very much and good afternoon uh, or good morning to those uh, in the united states thank you very much indeed thank you thank you jerry you're welcome